Carroll, uh, graduated from UC Davis. She served in local government on the school board in Modesto, the Modesto City Council, and she was elected mayor of Modesto in 1987. She later served as the director of intergovernmental affairs in the governor's office, so she worked at the state level as well as the uh, local level and served as assistant secretary of the California Resources Agency. As Mark may have mentioned, in 19... 97, she founded the Great Valley Center to promote the economic, social, and environmental well-being of California Central Valley uh, territory, ranging all the way from Redding to Bakersfield. And she has, that's been her baby, and she's run it and organized it so successfully that in a, just, just recently, Carol told me at lunch, she has, uh, her center has become an institute affiliated or part of, I should say, the latest, the, the newest University of California campus, UC Merced. And so Carol is now a member of uh, UC, for better and worse. Make sure that you have your uh, severance package signed off on before you do any work. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we'll keep that out of the newspapers, but anyway, I think it's, a, it's actually a great uh, synergistic uh, relationship between a think tank and a community-based organization in public policy and the university. So we are very grateful that you're willing to come and give this talk and look forward to it. The title is Making Room for California's Future why the Central Valley mo matters. You could tack on more than Highway 5. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for that nice introduction, and thank you all for being here. I was so fearful that I would come and there would only be eight of us. <laughs> We'd sit closely around a table and have a great discussion. Um, and I'm also very honored to be part of the Victor Jones lecture series. I never knew Victor Jones, or at least I don't know that I did. We certainly operated in many of the same arenas and um, I have people on my staff who worked for him and certainly many people who know him and he leaves a very big imprint on public policy in this state and the discussion of good governance, which um, Lord knows we need quite a bit more of. <clears throat> so I'm here to talk about the thing that I always talk about, which is California's Central Valley. And I was looking at the map this morning on the screen and saying, you know, it's not hard to see the valley when you look at a topographical map like that. Um, most people think of it in very small terms. They think of it as 50 feet on either side of 99 or 5 as they're driving north or south from Los Angeles to the Bay Area. And lots of people have never been north of Sacramento in the valley, which is quite a different place. Most of what I speak about today, I'll talk a little bit about the whole valley, but most of which I talk about today will be in the San Joaquin Valley, which is Sacramento South, only because the size of the population and the issues and the rate of growth and change are the most dramatic in that part of the region. So even though we work from Reading to Bakersfield, the majority of our efforts are at this point concentrated in the San Joaquin Valley. <clears throat> See if I can do this right. Look at that. So it seems to me that the first thing we have to do is talk a little bit about why we work at the regional level and what regions are. This is actually a map from 1935 that divided up the United States into very great geographic regions based on national planning and development around natural resources. Um, I, someone once said to me, and I think it's perhaps true, that a region is the area of government to which you kick problems that you cannot solve at the local level. And I think probably that's about as true as not, is that when we get very frustrated, we say, well, there must be another way, and we kick it up a little bit. But in California, as well as in other places, there are lots of ways of defining regions. We can do it by bioregions, and if you go to the CERES website on the State of California webpage, CERES being the California Environmental Resources something or other system, um, you can find a whole bunch of ways to search for data. You can search by bioregion, by watershed, by county. We once looked, you can do it by area code, zip code, SMSA, and 
One of the issues for all of us, I think, is the fact that the discussion has often been focused on regional government. Um, and certainly in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of reorganization around government and regional government. Portland in the late 70s, Minneapolis in the 60s, um, Indianapolis in 70 with UNIGOV, and most recently, just in 2003, Louisville organized into a sort of a unified city-county government. But most governance isn't about structures anymore uh, because we haven't been very successful in California reorganizing for structures. Some of you may remember that in the late 80s, <coughs> excuse me, the Sacramento area, Sacramento County and its cities tried a consolidation election and it fell on the rocks right toward the end of the election period right before the ballot, mostly around the issues of labor and public safety. The police decided they didn't want to be subsumed by the sheriffs and people didn't know what their employment future was and so that was the last real attempt at governmental reorganization or consolidation in California. <clears throat> On the other hand, I would argue that we actually have quite a bit of regionalism in California, we just don't have regional institutions. Um, one of the things that we could talk about, of course, is the Sacramento Regional Blueprint, which just happened in the last two years through the area SACOG, the Council of Governments, the equivalent of ABAG, in which people from six different counties had a very lively discussion about land use and transportation in the region and what the current transportation and the status business as usual um, continuation might create in terms of the region of the future. And arguably it has changed, at least in the short term, the kinds of development and transportation systems that are being contemplated for the region as people think more about maintaining the strength of the center cities and think about the transportation and air quality impacts of continuing to move everyone up into the foothills. But it's also very interesting that in California, we rarely talk about consolidation when there are problems. Our normal decision is to say, we'll pull out. We don't come together to solve problems, we secede. And so you can think about the San Fernando Valley and the big secession vote last year. You can remember perhaps that the uh, some of the pot growers in Mendocino County tried to split the county in half in the early 90s and the most remarkable of all is my favorite which is the state of Jefferson up in the northern part of the state which was actually originally conceptualized in the 1860s as a separate state but became uh, kind of a viable idea again in the 40s when the flag was created and someone stood up on the floor of the legislature and said that'll never happen in this part of the state and made some outrageous comment about resources or financial resources or road fees or something going to that part of the state that it wasn't going to happen and the local newspaper said they had been double crossed again. And that is the origin of the two X's in the center of the flag, um, that the state of Jefferson had been double crossed. If you drive the North State, you will know that public radio in that part of the state is Jefferson State Public Radio. There's a large barn on the side of the road that is painted, the roof says the state of Jefferson. And there are a number of people who still believe that if you're up in Shasta and Tehama County, that you are part of a separate world in a separate state. But the significance of that is the fact that we really have not had a strong history of coming together to solve problems. And that's the challenge of regions in this day and age. Now we do have certainly some regional structures and I think if you think about Victor Jones, um, he was very instrumental in starting the Association of Bay Area Governments in the 60s. We have the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency and then we had um, the multi-county regionalism effort that was created around the Natural Communities Conservation Planning Program and biodiversity in the 90s in Orange, Riverside and San Diego counties. I had the either the privilege or the opportunity of working on that. They used to call me the Tsarina, which was only mildly not true. Um, but, but all of those efforts had some kind of legal or financial imperative that drove the efforts. And I think that the challenge that I'm going to talk to you about a little bit more now in the Valley is that whereas maybe I can pull people together out of goodwill and doing the right thing, there is very little imperative that will keep them at the table. And that, it seems to me, is the challenge of regionalism in the 21st century. In California, no surprise, people want to vote on everything. They want to participate in decisions 
Um, and California actually has had more ballot measures per capita than any other union in the state. And uh, the all others is everybody that's not shown separately. But 14% of all the ballot measures in the United States come at the city or county level. One of the challenges that we have for a collaborative region rather than a structural region is that there is no basis for making voter based decisions because you cross so many jurisdictions you don't have the basis for taking things to the ballot either to support or to stop an initiative. But regionalism is more current, more relevant and maybe more important today than ever before. Uh, first of all, because people move through jurisdictions. We don't have live workspace that's in one jurisdiction any longer. And I started out trying to count how many political jurisdictions and elected boards and commissions and districts there were on my drive between Modesto and Berkeley and I gave up because there are not only cities and counties, there are water districts, conservation districts, special districts, sewage districts, community service districts, and each one school districts, and each one has separate boundaries and a little part of um, the control or the authority over part of our life. So all of a sudden, dealing with a single jurisdiction doesn't deal with all of the challenges and the problems that we would like to solve. The second, of course, is relatively obvious, and that is that environmental resources don't follow the boundaries of political jurisdictions, whether it's an air district, a water district, a bioregion, a habitat area. They follow the natural features of the landscape rather than any political jurisdiction. So if we're going to deal with our environmental concerns and the health of our environment, we certainly have to talk about it as a region. And as people move farther and farther away from urban centers into the foothills, into other states, into more rural areas, and that move is facilitated by telecommunications, it only expands the necessity for thinking about a region because the economic base expands and sort of spins out into greater and greater areas. So those are the reasons that we have regionalism, but it's still um, a very hard concept in some places. So let me talk now about region in terms of California's Central Valley. The first is, and you first you saw the topographic map, this is actually my favorite picture. This is the Central Valley as viewed from a satellite. We had it buzz, uh, Rusty Schweikert do an essay for us recently and he actually talked about seeing the valley from the satellite as he circled the earth. Um, unfortunately it was the winter time and what he remembers is that it was filled with fog and so it was a long elliptical white space in the middle of the state but nonetheless it's visible from outer space because it's such a large feature and if I can orient you just a little bit <coughs> obviously this is the Bay Area if you know the North Valley at all Sutter Buttes are I'm not sure they show very well, but Sutter Buttes are about in here. This is the Monterey Bay, and um, even though this is upside down, of course, the Tehachapi's would be at the top of the screen. So it is, in my mind, one large valley. It's two watersheds, the San Joaquin River and the Sacramento River, both of which exit through the Delta. But when I put this picture up, I always say to people, where are the walls? And in fact, it is one large place and there are many things that unite this place as a region. Its economy, its environment, its history, um, and certainly all of those biological things which come along with being part of a, a watershed. <coughs> um, this is fun because this is a map from the early our early 20th century and that arrow points to Tulare Lake which was a large lake that the Indians used to cross on reed boats uh, that could actually take you from the Kern River almost over to the coastline when it flooded and with the damming of the rivers and the changing of the control of water that lake is rarely visible anymore although in the floods of 1997 there was actually quite a bit of water in that in that basin again but the region this says three valleys. I would argue that there are only two valleys, but has been recognized as a different and special place since, um, really since the gold miners. The economy, of course, is based on agriculture, and historically, the first 
Europeans came to the region right after the gold, gold rush. Uh, there was a lot of dry farming and wheat. They came on the railroads and settled the cities, which is sort of the general route of Highway 99. The cities were formed along the railroads, and then eventually, of course, the highways came and replaced the railroads. But agriculture was then shifted and became the permanent crops that we see now, the orchards and the vineyards and so on, when irrigated water and the state and federal water projects bought, brought reliable water into agriculture and changed uh, really the character and the size and the productivity of agriculture in the region. Right now, the valley is one of seven places on the face of the earth that can produce more than 300 different crops. It's a Mediterranean climate. Um, it has a combination of water, soil, and air that allows for this enormous richness and diversity of agriculture. The state or the region produces about 25% of the food and fiber for the nation. And I should actually say food and fiber and beverages because that includes a growing amount of wine, um, which is an important part of our regional productivity. Um, in some communities, there are as many as one out of seven employees directly in agriculture and one out of three in jobs that are directly or indirectly related to agriculture. So it is a huge economic engine and very important in the region and that's one of the challenges for the region is thinking about how we can create an economic base that will sustain a growing population without destroying agriculture which still provides an important foundation that we don't in fact want to lose. So the story for the region is growth, growth, and more growth. And most of the, the greatest percentage or proportion of the growth for the state of California will likely be in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, a little bit less in Sacramento and the North Valley, but certainly in the San Joaquin Valley um, in the next 40 or 50 years. If you can imagine, we have to put in more people than the whole Bay Area by 2020. 10 new Fresnos, and some people think that's a good idea and some people think it's not a good idea, <laughs> by 2040, uh, and our population will be up 131 percent by 2050. Those are very big numbers when you start thinking about building schools, water waste, water treatment, waste treatment, roads, highways, all the kinds of things that are required to support a good quality of life in that part of the region. Hans is actually here. Hans's name is on the bottom of this slide because it's my very favorite slide in the whole world. If you look at this slide and you can see the colors, I don't know if you can. The bottom line, if you start with a 1970 base of 100, the bottom line is a growth rate for the United States. I should make Hans do this. I've learned this from him. But anyway, the United States grows relatively quickly, as he would say, for a Western industrialized nation. The next line, the green line, is the California growth rate, which of course is rapid compared to the rest of the United States. And here's the remarkable part. The red line is the growth rate of Mexico, and the yellow line at the top is the growth rate projected, or the actual growth rate for the San Joaquin Valley. So as of 1970 to the year 2000, the San Joaquin Valley is growing faster than the country of Mexico. Look what happens when it's projected out to 2040. The San Joaquin Valley will continue to outpace growth um, in Mexico, which we all think of as a very rapidly growing, rapid populating country. And so that is, um, it seems to me, the first challenge of the region, which we have to talk about, is accommodating and dealing with um, this enormous population change. Population growth comes from a variety of different sources, and if you guys would get your housing costs in line, I would have a little bit less of a problem. In the Bay Area, um, the average median single-family home in 2005 was $730,000, and if you're not a homeowner, you probably know that quite well. In California, 568,000, and in the San Joaquin Valley, 364,000. Now, that may look like a low number compared to California and the Bay Area, but I promise you that if you are living and working in the Valley, that number is increasingly unattainable, and we have seen a huge run-up um, in housing prices and a decrease in affordability that is proportional to the per capita income in the region. But nonetheless, if you have a Bay Area salary and you're crazy enough to think that you can live any kind of a life at all by driving two hours each way into a place with a different housing market, then people make that commute and come in to the, the San Joaquin Valley, especially 
into Stanislaus, San Joaquin, and Merced counties. But I can tell you there is a growing number, there are a growing number of people who are driving across Pacheco Pass into Los Banos and Merced, and increasingly people coming all the way over the Tehachapi's into Bakersfield and commuting from Los Angeles. So the commute patterns are quite dramatic, and it is generally driven by housing. We had this conversation at lunchtime, you know, when people move to the Livermore Valley, they generally move for quality of life. They moved because the houses were big, the neighborhoods were attractive, the schools were good, and so on. When they take that next leap into the Central Valley, they are generally doing it for economic necessity and less for quality of life. And so we find that the homeowner is, excuse me, being motivated by different, uh, different drivers. In addition to people moving for housing, there's a considerable amount of movement that comes into the valley from foreign migration, people coming primarily from Mexico, South and Central America, and Asia. And, Asia. and those um, people are coming mostly into the southern part of the San Joaquin Valley, which receives the largest number and percentage of immigrants. It, um, in many cases, has the greatest number of farm workers and farm-related jobs, which are attractants or magnets for immigrants. The challenge for us in this part of the region, and we've been working with PPIC and just about everybody we can corner on this, is to try to determine how much of the, the population is stable. Because I can give you example after example of communities that put a lot of money into language training and job development and job training and so on and so forth, and we don't see any decreases in the per capita, excuse me, and in the unemployment rate or any increases in per capita income. And that has led me to at least speculate that there is a certain amount of through movement. That people come, they get job skills, they get language training, and then they move into urban centers or into other states where the wages are higher and we're consistently being backfilled by the newest crop of immigrants. It's very hard to trace that, and we do see some mobility, but we can't obviously trace family by family. But nonetheless, in Kern, uh, Kings, Madeira, Tulare, to a certain extent, Fresno counties is where we see the greatest foreign immigration. And a great deal of the valley's population growth is actually being caused by birth rates, births over deaths. Um, and about 65% of the growth is birth rates. I like to say to everybody, it's a very fertile place and it isn't all peaches and almonds. <laughs> um, actually, both David Lyons and Hans are here. I should acknowledge PPIC, who has given me enormous uh, support and help by doing a lot of research and giving us some of the numbers that have helped us shape the discussion about the region. So a lot of these economic and demographic numbers come directly from PPIC. Um, this is the second great challenge for the region, it seems to me, which is poverty uh, and the economy. And the green line that goes up fast and down just a little tiny bit at the end is the per capita income uh, in the Bay Area. And the sort of brownish line that starts at about 80 in 1969 and goes down directly right through the beginning of the new century is the San Joaquin Valley. So what we have seen is that while the rest of the state went through enormous economic prosperity, booms and busts and so on, that the per capita income in the valley has consistently gone down and down and down. Um, now there are some truth and disclosure things that we have to say about that, and one of them is, is that when you have high birth rates, you have lots of per capita increase, but you don't have a lot of working people increase. So part of that is due to very high birth rates and babies. But nonetheless, this kind of per capita income has to sustain schools and daycare centers and health care and so on, and it simply is inadequate to meet the human and social needs of a very large portion of the population. Um, recently, the Congressional Research Service took a look at the San Joaquin Valley at the request of our region's congressional delegation and concluded two remarkable facts. If you take nothing away from this talk today, please, these two numbers. This region is growing faster than the country of Mexico and has a per capita income that is lower than Appalachia. Um, I could show you another slide, which is one that um, I'll tell you about. I won't show you the picture today, but there is a Save a Feed the Children's group from somewhere in the Midwest um, that surveyed the well-being of children throughout the United States and decided that there was more child poverty in Tulare County than anywhere else in the United States. And they're actually trucking food into this agricultural region to feed children there. 
And the newspaper, the local newspaper, said to one of the local residents, well, what do you think about this? And the quote from the newspaper, I'm not making this up, honest to gosh, said, those of us who live here have learned how to drive on the right roads so we don't have to look at this. And I would suggest to you that a lot of us drive on the right roads and that we don't always see the things that we don't like and don't want to see. So if you come to the Central Valley, you are likely to go to the places, I mean Sacramento is part of the Central Valley and maybe you'll go to a Kings game or maybe you'll even go down and see the Stockton Ports play or do something in Fresno, but you won't get off the roads and go to Early Mart and Parlier and some of the places where there is enormous poverty, but it's simply not on the roads that most of us travel. Highest percentage of kids under 18 living in poverty in those purple counties, mostly in the San Joaquin Valley, um, and huge and growing traffic problems. Now, we, I, when I first moved to Modesto in whatever it was, 1970 something, by the way, I went to Albany High School. I'm sort of at home here. Um, but when I first moved there, we used to talk about the rush minute in downtown Modesto, which was pretty brief and not so daunting, but it certainly our congestion has continued to increase. Um, congestion and vehicle hours of delay up 52% in the northern San Joaquin Valley and 577% in the south San Joaquin Valley, according to Caltrans. Um, again, very big number because it was a low base to start, but if you think about the incremental increase and how rapidly things are changing, you understand that we simply have got to get our hands around some of the issues. And it is the most polluted air basin in the United States right now with an enormous number of our kids and an increasing number of adults using inhalers for asthma. In some classes in Fresno, as many as one out of five children are using inhalers for asthma. We post days when children cannot play outside because of poor air quality. Um, people are asked not to use their fireplaces on no burn days because of poor air quality and it is a very complex and difficult problem which I would suggest you ask someone else to speak about because I get lost in Knoxes and things like that very quickly but it is a significant problem for the region. And of course the big issues of land use. I don't know if you can read that sign or not. It's a Modesto sign. It says notice this is an active almond ranch. Farming procedures will include spraying, harvesting, mowing, fertilizing and flood irrigation. People love to be near agriculture when the almond trees are blooming. That's about 14 days in February. <laughs> and the rest of the time, agriculture is an industry. It has all kinds of things that are not necessarily so pleasant. And we haven't done a very good job in the Valley of putting any kind of rational or reasonable separators between agricultural uses and residential uses. So here you see a bunch of backyards backing right up to the agricultural operation. There is a uh, end to this story, which is not a happy end, and that is that even though everyone in this county signs when they buy a house that they are in a farming ordinance, it's a right to farm county, you say the farmers were there first, they have certain operations and certain rights, there's something called the hassle factor. And even though the farmer has the legal right to continue farming, when his urban neighbors complain because he's spraying or making noise, the sheriff comes out and says, well, your neighbors complain. He says, I have a right to farm. The sheriff says, you're right. Or when the mower or the disker is on the county road at 4 o'clock in the morning when the commuters are trying to get to the highway and honking and passing aggressively and so on. Eventually, the farmers give up. And so because of the hassle factor, this farmer finally sold out. And his orchard is now a subdivision. And he did so reluctantly. It wasn't that he was cashing out his land. He wanted to keep farming. He just couldn't deal with the hassle factor. So the questions of how to put houses for all these new people in the region is perhaps one of our biggest challenges. Come along the Great Valley Center. Um, we started in 1997 with support from the big three California philanthropies, the Hewlett Foundation, the Irvine Foundation, and the Packard Foundation. And <clears throat> this was a time when the stock market was beginning to grow. Um, the foundations realized that the valley was truly the other California. People didn't know very much about it. In fact, very few people knew much about the valley and that this was an opportunity for them to expand their philanthropy into a very underserved region. Um, they have been very generous in supporting us for almost 10 years. That funding base is changing a little bit. Um, I'm very proud of our headquarters building, which we bought in 2002. It's an old church, uh, which we have done an adaptive reuse on. And I will also give you the economics, because again, you're in the Bay Area and I'm in the Valley. 
This is a 12,000 square foot building with an adjacent eight car parking lot. I think there's eight spaces in it, um, which we bought in 2002 for $315,000. Um, now we put quite a bit of money into remodeling it, but um, it was quite a bargain at the time. Since we've downsized a little in the last few years, we have tenants in it now, and so the lower level and a couple of offices are rented to a law firm and the Campaign for College Opportunity and Sustainable Conservation. Anyway, it pays 65% of our mortgage, so we've been able to stay in this quite wonderful old building in Modesto, and we're very proud of it. Um, it has been our goal since the very beginning to develop a sense of region and bring people together in a way that would improve the likely outcomes of the region. I think um, you heard our mission, the Great Valley Center's mission is to support organizations and activities that improve the economic, social, and environmental well-being of this great Central Valley. Now, we, we did this very carefully. Economic, social, and environmental well-being um, was our way of saying the sustainability of the Central Valley, but sustainability is such a contentious and challenging word that we said, why argue about the vocabulary? Everybody understands economic, social, and environmental. We had a very broad mandate from the foundations to use a variety of strategies, which we created in many cases based on needs, to to move the region toward the kinds of things that we thought would be healthier and better in the long run. We still have leadership programs, and I'll talk about that in a minute. We've become sort of the go-to place for media because we have lots of data and information about the region. Our website is widely used. I'm always amazed at how many people use our website, really from all over the world. And we started off as a regranting organization and were able to distribute about $5 million in small through a small grants program to help stimulate and provide seed capital to a number of things that we thought needed supporting in the region. And we functioned as a regional intermediary. I would tell you that from my point of view, partly when we started and partly because I've learned a little bit, that these are the key issues for this region. The first and the one that drives everything is the issue of growth and change. Population growth and demographic and economic change are a big part of the public policy process and the challenges and the conversations and the economy and everything that's happening in the valley. It's difficult to deal with those issues because institutions and local governments have limited capacity. I can't tell you how many local elected officials run for office saying, I was born here, I was raised here, I grew up here, and I'm never going to leave here, and I don't know anything that's happening outside my borders. So there's a lot of parochialism, a lot of very local view of the world, um, and people really have not necessarily been part of the change to the global economy or the technology re revolution or whatever. Um, when we started in 1997, the decision-making process was fragmented. It was very easy to marginalize the valley because the legislators and other people could say, well, if Stockton can't agree with Fresno and Fresno can't agree with Bakersfield and nobody's listening to Modesto, you guys go out in the hall and fight it out and come back when you're all together, and nobody ever got all together, and so the valley was often ignored. It was also often ignored because um, there is this strong independent streak on a lot of people who've grown up on farms, and they don't want to ask for anything. They don't want federal assistance. They don't want state programs. They don't want bureaucrats. And for a very long time, they were able to exist without that kind of connection, while well, those days are changing quickly. And the fourth thing that I think is really a problem for the region is what we've labeled the aspiration gap. The region often considers itself to be the weak cousin, the poor sister, a second class system, sister, I'm a second class citizen. We can't do that because we're just the valley. We don't deserve that because we're only the Central Valley. And until we get people to rise up and say the communities of the Valley in the 21st century ought to be just as good as they are anywhere in California, that kids deserve the same opportunities, the same access to higher education, that there ought to be upward mobility so that people who are educated don't have to leave the region, until we change that aspiration gap and get people all trucking along in the same way, we won't ever solve the issue of the valley. So we developed at the center some ways of maybe helping change those things. The first thing is um, I left Sacramento with some virtual bumper stickers which I carry with me at all times. One of them by the way says 
It's not a rational process, but that's not the one I'm talking about today. The one I'm talking about today says there are no leaders without followers. And I think we often call for leadership and expect our elected leaders to go out and do something dramatic and wonderful. And you know what? They will never do that unless they think that's what their constituents want them to do. So without saying to the constituents, you have to tell people to do this, at least we have to give them permission. We have to allow them to think 15 years in the future instead of the next election cycle. We have to allow them to plan a transportation system and not be satisfied with just fixing potholes. So a lot of what we've done in the last few years is to talk about the issues of the region, to talk a lot about the fact that we have choices, that we don't have to accept things, that we can actually influence the way public policy happens, and to talk about the region as though it were a real region. And we've done a lot of that by providing regional information, by aggregating data, by putting that great picture of the satellite view of the region, which says we're one place. So we had a numerical and a data identity, we had a visual identity, and then we talk a lot about it. Um, and, and I think that's had some impact, which we'll talk about a little bit. In terms of limited capacity, we said, well, how do we deal with limited capacity and raise the capacity of the region to make better decisions? I'm going to do this in reverse order, but the first thing is we have been able, just because of our positioning and some great opportunities, to be the kind of link between that parochial Central Valley and a lot of things that are happening outside the region. So nobody in the region would call for collaborative economics or would do a study on ubiquitous high-speed broadband technology in rural areas or whatever, but we can do that because we're rooted in the valley and we connect both with the valley and the outside world. So we've been able to infuse the region with a lot of new ideas and bring people in with certain credibility that might not have otherwise happened. Our grants. In many cases, we've been able to be the seed grant, the starting money, the affirmation. One of the most dramatic was um, San Joaquin County, Stockton. And they wanted to do some farmland conservation, and they weren't quite sure how to do it, and the planning director needed some help. And we gave them a $25,000 grant to start doing an agricultural element in their general plan. And the Board of Supervisors, which was either shamed or embarrassed, I'm not sure which, said, well, if the Great Valley Center can put some money on the table, we have to. And they put $375,000 to match our $25,000 and created an agricultural element in that region's general plan. We used another small grant to help the people in Fred Fresno uh, organize a cluster around water and irrigation technology, which was our strategy for building on the local economy. And once we brought together people that were all part of this cluster and didn't know that each other existed, uh, they've organized a fabulous cluster. They are now sending marketing teams to Europe and Asia to sell irrigation systems and water conservation systems. They got a $3 million grant from Congress to build a research center and they're now working on an $11 million global irrigation technology center in Fresno. Um, the good news is you won't see our name on these things. That's what being an intermediary is. You know, you sprinkle a little water and, and walk away. That's okay. And the other piece that we think has been really important has been leadership development. In the case of community level leaders where we have a lot of ethnic diversity and people who are coming into leadership positions with different backgrounds, people who have not been on boards of directors of the symphony or not been in the Rotary Club for 20 years but who have legitimate community issues, we have a program for them that is based on teaching them the complexity of issues in the region. They talk to farmers and farm workers, and uh, developers and environmentalists. They talk to health care workers and school people. And after six months, they're totally confused. They want us to come in and tell them the right answers, and we don't. What we tell them is, these are complicated problems with a number of valid points of view, and if you're going to be a wise leader, you need to understand that. Of our 150 alumni in that program, 20 have run for office, 12 are currently serving in local office, 25 are in appointed positions like planning commissions and boards in their communities, and 60 some are on local nonprofit boards. And so I, I'm often accused, and I guess I'll cop to the, I'll cop to the uh, charge that I'm building an army. And what we're trying to do is, is create a generation of leadership that is smarter, that is not easily marginalized, that is networked and connected across the region, and that has a at least some wise insight into the complexity of problems. We do another program, which I also tell you a little anecdote about. It's one of my favorites. This one's for the people who are already in elected office. And I know I'm at Berkeley, but I have to tell you, I took 
I brought Mohammed to the mountain. I said, who's the best local government education people in the whole world? It's Harvard. It's the Kennedy School of Government from my point of view. So we hired Marty Linsky from the Kennedy School of Government to run a local elected officials training program. And he comes in and he says, how many of you have ever lost an election? And very few hands go up. And he says, well, then my guess is you're not exercising enough leadership. In fact, he says, this might be the biggest group of panders ever assembled on the <laughs> West Coast. <laughs> well, I thought I'd lost my audience for sure. They stuck with it. And we, <clears throat> we now run that, that program once or twice a year. And the point of that program is not at all about issues. They can learn issues once they're in office from the League of Cities or counties or whatever. We talk there about what it means to use courage in your decision making process, how to exercise leadership without getting unelected because there's no point in being a wise leader and then getting defeated at the next election. And again, we've tried to network people. We bring city and county people together so that we take down some of the barriers that affect people. And again, it's all part of this building um, an army for better outcomes. Fragmentation and all that isolated decision making. We bring people together at conferences. We mix the audiences. We do a lot of convening and coordination. And the most remarkable device has been Highway 99. Uh, we started off with a business group of people who said, you know, if you want to help business development in the region, you've got to fix this highway. It looks like heck. It doesn't function very well, and it's deleterious to the reputation of the region. So we said, okay, and we created the Highway 99 Task Force, and I wrote a little editorial about saving the oleanders, which I thought defined the character of the region, those wonderful oleanders on the highway, and I got a huge response. People cared about it. So all of a sudden, our Highway 99 Task Force had 150 members. They published a design guide. They inventoried scenic resources and not so scenic resources. They developed ideas for gateways into communities. Caltrans said, my gosh, if there's that much community interest in Highway 99, then maybe we ought to uh, do something. And they did the first master plan for the whole corridor from Stockton to Bakersfield. And then Sonny Wright McPeak said, well, if there's a master plan and all this interest in the highway, we better have a business plan. And so Caltrans created a business plan for all of the improvements necessary to bring the corridor up to reasonable standards. That's the $6 billion plan that you may have heard about. And the governor uh, has proposed $1 billion of his transportation bonds as the first tranche of funding to help Highway 99. Now, I can tell you all that there's already some pushback from other areas that are saying, how come the Central Valley gets so much? We all want our fair share, and you can't have that much of the $12 billion just for your region. And I would suggest to you that if we're talking about fair share, we ought to average it over 10 or 15 years, and then I think we ought to get $2 billion instead of $1 billion. But anyway, Highway 99 has become a very interesting organizing device for the region. In terms of the aspiration gap, we talked to everybody about our goal for the region being finding parity with the rest of the state in terms of income, in terms of environmental quality, in terms of um, quality of life, amenities, parkland, and all of that sort of thing. And we're working very hard to help people craft an economic development strategy that builds on the region's assets that doesn't simply export what the Bay Area doesn't want anymore. Sorry, Bay Area, I love you all, but the valley is different. So we're looking at the potential for solar and renewable energy as being an economic activity. We're looking at agri-food um, informatics as a way of blending the technology development in Silicon Valley and the needs of the agricultural industry, the water and irrigation technology cluster. There are a number of things which we think can be done to move into a more diversified economy without sacrificing the agricultural base. Back to Highway 99, which becomes very important in a couple of other ways. One of my other theories about regionalism is that regional, regionalism is an okay com concept when it adds value. If you ask people to give something up for sake of the region, it's much harder. So part of what we have tried to do is say, okay, how can being a region add value to the San Joaquin Valley? Well, the first thing is it's harder to ignore a region that has people working together. They can't put us out in the hall anymore and say, go away until you all agree when we're all standing together. When the six members of the congressional delegation asked for that Congressional Research Service report, it carried great weight. So because we got our act together a little bit, and because we have some people like Mayor Autry, who is standing between Secretary McPeak and Supervisor Connie Conway here, 
uh, the mayor of Fresno, people said we can't ignore the valley any longer. So in October of, excuse me, in July of 05, the governor created something called the California Partnership for the San Joaquin Valley. Eight cabinet secretaries, which is a huge commitment, eight local government appointees and eight civic sector appointees charged with bringing back specific recommendations for improving the future of the region to the governor by this fall. Um, eight working groups, there's eight counties involved, so these are not magic numbers, but at the Great Valley Center we're working on land use, transportation, and telecommunications. And it is our hope, and this is where it gets a little iffy, it is our hope to use this opportunity with multiple stakeholders and the cooperation of the Resources Agency and Business Transportation and Housing and California Department of Food and Agriculture to create sort of a master strategy for the region and to give us some direction in terms of what are we really going to do about farmland? Do we care about saving farmland or do we not? What are we going to do about water in the region? Do we put development in the existing cities along the Highway 99 corridor or do we move it east where it has a bigger impact on the Sierra foothills or do we keep it west in the coast range and what do we do about infrastructure? So we're beginning a very high level conceptual discussion about strategies for the future of the region. That in itself would be daunting but then we have something called the Blueprint Grant. Remember I talked to you about how Sacramento had used a Blueprint Grant to bring six counties together. Well, we were just awarded $2 million from the state of California and another 500000 from the Air District, which will be shared by the eight councils of government. We don't have a single county cog in the region. We have to do this by cooperation. And the hope, if, if we are successful, if we are lucky and we get it all right, we hope to take whatever regional strategies we can craft and implement them through land use and transportation plans at the county level through the COGS and then put those back together again in a more specific plan for the region. Um, it's not easy. We have 48 local governments. We have people who are not used to working together. Um, frankly, I would have liked another two or three years to do more constituency building and get my army a little bigger, but you work with what you have, and the moment is now, and so we're going to see if we can pull it off. We do a conference every year, and this year our conference is at the tipping point because I firmly believe that the moment is right now, this year, where we are either going to get our act together and come up with something that works, that leads to a more success, successful, healthier, more sustainable and economically contributing region, or we will end up with a region that recreates all of the mistakes of the past and perhaps worsens with a poor environment, with perpetual poverty, with terrible land use plans, and with people driving on the right roads so they don't have to look at it. Um, it is a region that I think is enormously important, could be very important to the state of California, but our chances for success are still unknown, and it's a, it's a tightrope that we're walking, I promise. Thanks. Our question and answer session now. Um, I'm going to ask you to speak into the mic because we are webcasting this. Uh, Carol, you want to help sure. me with this? Absolutely. Anyone have a question they'd like to ask the speaker? Hi. Uh, Hi. The Central Valley is dealing not only with uh, rapid growth but increasing diversity. And so, um, what kinds of challenges has diversity, racial, religious, class, lifestyle posed for the Central Valley and how have you uh, begun to address them? It is something that we're very aware of and it is a big challenge. Um, I guess I'll give you an anecdote. We were doing a little bit of a scan of the region trying to identify challenges in the region and strategies and someone in an audience like this said to me, Carol, I have 14 different language groups in my apartment building. I cannot get people to agree on tenant rules. How are you going to get people to agree on public policy and community goals? And that is a huge problem because we have not only all of the immigrant populations which are relatively obvious from Mexico and China, but we have the Punjabis, we have Russians, we have Sikhs, we have people literally from all over the world. Um, I think the whole issue of civic engagement 
of every one of the population groups is a big challenge for us. And we're working on that a lot. That is really the intent of our leadership program. Remember the one I talked about with the emerging leaders? Um, of those numbers that I gave you, the 150 alumni, the elected officials, and so on, more than half of, half of them are non-white. We work very hard to provide leadership development and um, communications opportunities for people across different races and ethnicities. Um, our conference brings together people and I just love our conference because we don't just have planners, we don't just have engineers or truckers, we have everybody and they all sit together in sessions and there's a lot of discussion. Um, we actually are planning something which is a little risky, uh, hopefully this year and in conjunction with UC Merced and if anybody wants to help us, I'd love your help. We're gonna try something called a regional conversation. And the point of that conversation will be a facilitated dialogue over a weekend around just these issues. How do we get people with different backgrounds, different cultures, different ethnicities to talk to each other about public policy and how do we open those lines of communication? We'll publish a white paper as a result of that conversation and hopefully it will create for the Great Valley Center some opportunities for projects and communities and hopefully it will create for the university some research opportunities to deal with those issues because I think maybe more in the valley than in some of the urban centers because of the opportunity to be isolated and rural. We haven't brought people together as much as I think we should for a cohesive community agenda. Uh, you mentioned the words I wanted to hear and I'm interested in learning about UC Merced. What impact will the new university have on your development? How are you going to work with them? Perhaps we need a branch of the Institute for Governmental Studies there, I don't know. But uh, would you talk about the university's Absolutely. role in terms of development? I think that's really very, sure. very important for California. Sure, and I don't know whether you were here or not, um, w the Great Valley Center has just become part of the university. So um, I'm happy to talk about it, and I know the Chancellor would be happy to talk about it too. First of all, I have to tell you that I was mayor of Modesto when the conversations about a new university in the Valley started, and it was very exciting, and we went through the process of narrowing sites and, and so on, and so Merced was chosen, and you probably know Merced has its share of environmental challenges. It's not entirely permitted yet, but it's there. And if you go to visit the campus, you drive through low hills and past a hundred cows. Carol TK likes to say she has a hundred cows. And all of a sudden there's a line of trees and three very big buildings that sort of rise up out of nowhere. The library, the classroom building, and the engineering building are now open. Uh, there's 875 students there this year and there will be probably 1,500 to 2,000 there next year. It's going to have a huge impact on the region. Um, this will probably be the first Hispanic serving institution in the UC system. I think they're very close to getting that status right now. There's a very aggressive outreach program because of the aspiration gap, remember? And so part of what we're trying to do is everyone is trying to figure out how to get to kids in especially the isolated rural communities and say you can go to college. There's scholarship money, there's opportunity. Carol has a model with this university, Carol TK, of a distributed campus so you can take classes in Bakersfield or Fresno or soon in Modesto. You don't have to be on the campus for all four years. Um, I think it will probably take 10 years for the real impact of a new university to be felt in the region, but I think it is very promising and very hopeful and we're very excited um, about having that there. I can also tell you that if you go to the bookstore on the UC Merced campus, you can buy a very special t-shirt. It says, UC Merced, still undefeated. <laughs> We have a little contingent here from the design school, and I wonder if you can talk about your experience with the interface between design and policy and the extent to which the um, Great Valley Centers tried to use physical proposals for architecture and landscape to mobilize public opinion in favor of change. How long would you like to? I'd take you back with me. You stay for <laughs> weeks. It's one of my big hobby horses, and I hope you knew that when you asked the question. Um, one of the first projects that we did was a design competition for the region and it was an ideas competition. It wasn't site specific and it was called Housing the Next 10 Million. It was the first architectural design competition that we know of that was done totally online, which means that we had entries literally from all over the world. I think we had five continents, 22 countries, bunches of states. And what we found was that people wanted to talk about how to accommodate large populations, many, in many cases, that were moving 
moving from rural to urban settings in China and in the Philippines, all these different countries. So um, we use that, we use the entries to that as a way of sparking discussions in communities. And we took the design boards and traveled them from community to community and had receptions with city councils and public receptions and put them on display in public places. And then we published a little book with the ideas that we gave to all the elected officials in the region. And they're not they're not magic. It's things like um, think of more density or put edges on your open space or save agricultural land or build up and not out. But those books are still being distributed. And right now, and this is even more fun, remember Highway 99 is the key to everything. And we're trying to spark interest in renewable energy. We right now, are you guys entering, have a design competition for the Green Stop. And we've coined a word called a green stop, which is a sustainable rest stop on the highway. And Caltrans is co-sponsoring it. The first one will be, we hope, in Tipton, which is down in Tulare County. And if you've traveled in other states, you know that rest stops, highway rest stops, are often buildings. They have tourism information. They have um, economic stuff. And we get a picnic table and a potty. And that's simply insufficient. So we said, let's think about a green stop. And so the idea that the designers are being challenged with is to come up with an environmentally sustainable, off-the-grid building that would reflect the context and character of the region and not only not use any electricity on the grid, but treat all of its water on site. Then if we get that, then we're going to take a run at the state regulation which says you can't have any commercial activities in the rest stops and wouldn't it be nice to have a cup of real coffee instead of vending machine coffee and maybe even a small farmer's market at which you could buy the fresh fruit that's produced in the region. The entries for that, um, the deadline for entering is in April. We'll judge and award at our conference in May. Good design is really important, but I don't have a vote anymore, so all I can do is offer ideas and stimulate discussion, and we do that every way that we can. Yes? Oh. Um, the um, San Francisco Chronicle featured a story on the front page a week or two ago about the conflict between um, the developers in the Valley and the experts at the university over the use of over the grand scheme of building a lot of buildings in land that seems to be below sea level. And um, it was a full page story and I sort of like your comments on how you see that issue heating up. Well, I, I actually left the um, California Planning Roundtable this morning. They were talking about the same thing and we were talking about it um, at lunch. I, I take a relatively hard line personally. Now, now I'm talking me and not the Great Valley Center. I take a relatively hard line personally that if people choose to build in areas of hazard, they ought to do so at their own risk. And I think insurance rates ought not be equalized. They ought to reflect the risk of where people build. And if you can't guarantee people's safety, you ought not put them in jeopardy. The response of the planner this morning was, well, that's all of Sacramento. And I said, well, does the people in Sacramento somehow deserve more jeopardy than everybody else does? I mean, I think it's fairly clear that if we are going to assume the public liability, we ought to be making harder decisions about those choices. Um, but right now, we are so far along into precedent and entitlements and a bunch of other things that I think it's very hard to withdraw. We're, we're almost hooked. Um, and I think we're going to have to make some really hard choices. I understand that Harrison Fraker and some people are going to do a symposium here on the impact of flooding in Northern California and model a levee break. And so if you're interested in the issue, I think it's a great time to have the discussion.